Welcome to Chapter 2. Now, Chapter 2 is going to be an interesting experience for us because there's a lot of old familiar territory. If you've done international marketing or consumer behavior or introduction to marketing, you will find some very familiar content ground, which is good. I mean, that's the point. That's why you do these subjects, is so you know stuff. So it's going to be great. So this is a really good part. For those of you who are looking at the material going, ah, I've not done either of those. Well, the reason we've got this element here is that this is the highlights reel, so you can pick up and come up to speed. So the key elements of this is that the slide deck are going to be a much reduced and a very cut down set of highlights here because I'm going to get you to read the book. And that's one of the keys to this subject is co-creation and co-production. In the service dominant logic principle of customer co-creation, which is one of the things that underpins this subject, the textbook itself has the embedded service of education and learning. So when you read the book, you unlock that service. What we are going to talk about in this deck is we're going to talk about the three stages and draw your attention to some of the key areas that you need to be emphasizing. The nature of services marketing is that it is very dependent on consumer behavior and drives a lot of theory from how we understand individual and collective responses. Now one of the things I do want to mention early in this point is that some of the international marketing stuff is a little touch and go. Okay, some of it's downright dodgy. Uh, so when we're looking here at the impact of cultural norms and values, don't assume homogeneity. Don't assume everybody from up culture operates the same way. This isn't Star Trek where everyone wears the same jumpsuit and everyone on the planet has the same color jumpsuit apart from the bad guy. When I was looking over this chapter, I had some serious doubts about some of the elements that were being raised, particularly around collectivism and individualism. And particularly, there was a couple of points about face and loss of face, where if there is a group of people I have met who cannot stand to lose face, it's young males of Western culture who happen to be on the internet. Um, you go to YouTube, you go to video game forums, you play video games, you'll find a bunch of people who can't take loss of pride. They're bad at it. They just don't know how to deal with it. And if you're one of those people right now watching this video and you're starting to twitch, hiya. Thanks for proving my example. Awesome. So let's look here now at the three stages uh, where services marketing and consumer behavior link together. And we need to be focusing on different key ideas and elements. So top of the list, in the pre-purchase decision making, a lot of old familiar territory. So again, information searches, evoke sets, this is drawing on stuff you should know from advertising theory. There's a return. This chapter has a really useful element in talking about the evaluation of alternatives. Now in chapter one, we mentioned that search experience and credence were going to be important. And here's the detail on them in this chapter. So I want to flag that, highlight that. That's a really key one you want to look at. The thing about the three attributes is that search puts you much closer to physical goods. If you've got elements and aspects that can be seen, observed, and even tested before the service takes place, it's a search attribute. In the middle, you've got the experience attributes where the only way you're going to know about it is during. 
So search attributes on, say, going out to dinner. You can look at the menu. The menu can tell you what the food's going to be like. The experience attribute is going to be the atmosphere of the restaurant and the flavor. Now, you can imagine the flavor, but the flavor only comes during the point where you're actually consuming the food. Credence attributes tend not to take place at restaurants. Whereas if you think about legal services or medical services, credence attributes, and we always joke about this in terms of if you've got a lawyer, you've hired a lawyer because you're in a situation where you're not able to deal with the legal problem at hand by yourself. Credence attributes are such that you, if you got 12 months, you either had a really good lawyer because you needed you deserve seven years, or you had a terrible lawyer because you should have been off free. And with credence, you're not really sure if you know whether you had good or bad service. The other element I want to draw your attention to, perceived risk. Probably one of the most important areas for you personally, as a student, and also someone studying marketing, is to become really versed and familiar with perceived risk. Now, risk has a series of subcategories. I know you're probably thinking, doesn't everything have subcategories? Sensory, social, physiological, temporal, financial, functional. Go through these in detail. Look at these in depth. Sensory risk is really interesting in service delivery because sensory risk is much more apparent when the only thing you've got to judge is your own personal experience. What is my risk that I will experience a sensory overload in attempting to evaluate the service? Social risk is about the interaction of others. Social risk I always find to be quite interesting, particularly when we look at behavior inside a tutorial room or in a subject. Psychological risk is the personal. Temporal risk. Now this is one that's going to be a big factor for you this semester. You're having to sink a lot of energy and effort into this subject to stay above board to basically meet a uh, 15 academic articles, reading requirements. What you want to be is reducing your temporal risk. You want to be less worried that you are wasting time by engaging in content and more positively seeing that as an investment. You also have functional and financial risks. Uh, financial risks are interesting in terms of services of what happens if something changes. So you're in the middle, you put your car in for servicing, and in the process of uh, fixing one problem, they discover a second and a third problem. So suddenly you've got a budget blowout. And the number of times that I've had phone calls from the mechanic, which has been, well, we found problem you know, X, and there was Y and Z in there as well. I was like, I know you have to ask for permission to fix the other two parts, but will the car run if you don't fix Y and Z? No? Well, I guess you're going to have to fix it. So there are certain points where financial risk becomes an element of services where a better, the more effective the service is, the greater chance that you're going to uncover something you didn't expect. So with the risk, with risk perception comes risk reduction. And there are a sequence of ways in which people will reduce risk. And one of the most important ones in this is the information search. People will, risk creates uncertainty. Uncertainty requires resolution. Now, the fact that you're at uncertainty means that you have insufficient information to process, to solve the problem. So risk will often trigger information searches. It will can trigger uh, evaluation through word of mouth, seeking out word of mouth. And particularly when we're looking at something like a social risk, this is where you will pose the question and throw in the asking for a friend. Well, 
would people think less of me if I was to go to this particular nightclub? Just asking for a friend. You also on your information search at the service itself, you'll query, you'll seek additional information from the employees. Pre-service, you'll look at reviews. Post-service, you'll look at reviews. You'll find, it, particularly if you've come out of a service experience and you're unsure, have you ever gone to a movie, come out of the movie, not been sure about it, and then proceeded to Google the movie and look at the IMDb reviews and go to Rotten Tomatoes and look at the reviews? You are trying to reduce cognitive dissonance and risk perception through additional information. During the service, now again, pull up your, th link your thoughts, credence, search, experience. Those are your three, your three attributes. So you've got to think about your attributes here. How will your attributes overlap with your risk reduction protocols? On a credence, it's really hard to get that extra information. On a experience, you're going to be dependent on the service queues. On a search, you've got the opportunity to uh, find out a lot of information through prior to the service. But during the service, there'll be a lot of queue triggering that you'll be looking for. You'll be looking, is there a warranty? Is there a guarantee? Is there a if I'm not satisfied, can I at least alleviate my financial risk? You know, sure, I'm not going to get that time back, but at least I've got the cash, right? This is also why when you've had a bad experience in a movie, you're, quite often your commentary is to the effect of, well, there's two hours of my life I won't get back. Wouldn't have got those two hours back any other set of conditions, but you felt the loss of those two hours because it was such a bad movie. Of course, if this is your ninth Michael Bay movie that you've gone to and had that experience, please pick another director. During the service as well, though, you'll also be looking for cues and evidence from the service environment. So this is why we talk about the service scape and the physical evidence. For example, if you come into a doctor's surgery, you'll note that they have their qualifications up around the wall come into an academics office and you'll note that there are books, books everywhere, books that imply learning and reading. And there'll be awards, prizes and trophies and degrees stuck up on the wall so people can see, hey, this person has a piece of paper validating their service skill set. So accreditations are a way to tangibilize the skills of an employee. Finally, on the risk reduction is, for high risk, a lot of people will, once they find a service that they become comfortable with, it will create a barrier for them to move. The idea of, you know, it could start even being a bad service. They could be going, like, yeah, I know I'm getting a bad service now, but it could be worse if I go somewhere else. If you ever find yourself at that point, go somewhere else, it will be better. Also, particularly if you're with a group of friends and you're still going to the same place and you're liking it less and less each time, go somewhere different. All right, let's talk a couple of theoretical models. The service encounter. This is the Zethamol, Barry and Parashimamon. Zethamol later goes on with Parashimamon to create um, SurfQual model, Zethmal teams up with Bitna and creates the uh, service gap model. Zethmal is one of the big influential names in services, probably one of the smartest people to have worked in the field. So opportunity exists to look at their work, always look at it. So the service encounter consists of a sequence of parts. You'll note that we have the customer sitting down on one side here. So we have the individual needs of the customer, what they believe is possible to take place in the service, the context, the situational factors of the service. So think back to consumer behavior, all the different situational factors. And these create two mental parameters. You have the desired service, which is an upper statement, so a top end statement, 
and you have an adequate service. And this is the lower end statement. So the gap between desired and adequate is referred to as the zone of tolerance. And the zone of tolerance basically is if you deliver a service between adequate and desired, customer will be okay with that. And it's an acceptable service. It's fine. If you go over better than the desired service, it's called delight, and the customer is more than fine. The customer is happy. The customer is delighted. What tends to happen, though, is that if you delight a customer, it moves up the benchmark of what adequate and desired look like. So it shifts upwards. An adequate service, if you go below it, is a service failure. And the adequate service, the bottom line on an adequate service is the perception of the customer, not necessarily anything objective that you come up with in your service designs. Now, what influences desired and adequate is these factors of the past experience. So if you've gone somewhere and you know the food's okay, so you've got a selection of possible places you can go for lunch, and you have the one that you know is, it's okay, it's tolerable, it's fast. So it's the adequacy comes from the speed, the flavor is not brilliant but acceptable, and the desired service is, so long as I don't get food poisoning, and I'm back at work in 20. And you go there and you get something, you know, the actual there's actual flavor in the food today. You're delighted. You had a very low expectation. So a benchmark from your prior experiences, you can have low expectations that get exceeded. You're also looking at here the zone of tolerance and the desired and the adequacy comes from word of mouth, what others have described the service to you as, and what you've experienced from rival firms that offer a similar product offer. So there's a way, there's a series of ways in which as a customer, you learn adequate service, you learn what's a minimum acceptable standard and what's a desired standard and what's better than you were expecting. So this is where in purchase and consumption, again, we're seeing the return to a couple of key ideas in the chapter. So pay attention to the high contact, medium contact and low contact and how those service encounters differ. So we're looking at this in terms of the three different levels. We're looking at in a high contact, high customer contact, the emphasis is really on the people. Whereas on a lower to medium, the emphasis turns into the physical service environment. So it's people versus service scape in a certain aspect. So you've got to be looking for that. All right, a couple more quite significant, quite important frameworks for you to go off and read, assess, and get a grip on. And role theory, look, this is one of the big ones. So when we start talking about service roles and service role theory, get back to that Grove original paper. Go have a look at that. There's the reference in the textbook. Go track it down. Go give that another read. But basically, a service role is you know when you go to a service that there are, because you are co-producing and you are participating, there are certain behaviors you need to undertake. And you learn those behaviors during the delivery of the service. To assist that, you find that there are service cues. And this is cue as in trigger rather than line of people. So the service cue is when there's an action, it may require a corresponding reaction from you, or when you take an action, that the staff will react to you. So you walk into, we take a complicated uh, service exchange, you walk into McDonald's, you walk up to place an order, the hi may I help you is your trigger to place your order. Now the design of the menus being at an angle over the head of the 
uh, service staff is that your unspoken cue is you are to have made your decision whilst you are lining up. So you can see the menus, make your decisions, and then play your role. There will be a series of action reaction triggers. Would you like fries with that? Would you like a drink with that? Is that all? Dine in, take away. Cues to contextualize and give additional information to the service staff so they know how to prepare your, uh, how to make certain that they have given you what you want and also how to prepare uh, the appropriate delivery platform. So there's cues, actions and reactions. There's also expectations. There are sequences. And if you're like me and you go on to study services marketing for an extended period, you will occasionally forget and get out of sequence because you've paid attention and you know people's scripts. And before now, I have answered the entire service script, one of the restaurants that I frequent, Nando's. Every now and then I forget that I'm supposed to let the staff member ask me the questions. And particularly if I'm tired, I will answer in sequence and just neatly respond to all the things that they're supposed to ask before they've had a chance to ask. Occasionally they'll look baffled at me and sometimes they'll just go, okay, it's clearly shops here too often. But your expectations become sequences that you have learned from experience so you know trigger, response, call, reaction. So this brings us down to the whole idea of the role of congruence. When we're in a service, are we playing our role? Are we doing the right thing? Now, if I'm answering the questions before the staff member has a chance to ask, I'm not playing my role properly. I'm out of sequence. No, I'm not more effective. No, I'm not more efficient. In fact, I am less effective and less efficient because I am not fitting into, by answering before that it's been asked, they still have to think through those questions. Now I'm just being annoying rather than being helpful. So I can just slow down and wait for the triggers in order to give my responses. Also, because sometimes the triggers come from on-screen prompts, and if I am moving faster than the prompting, that's not helping. So if you know the theory, if you know the role, and you know what the cues are, and you're not playing your part in the role, you're not doing your service properly. So the other aspect of role theory is that there's a section in the chapter on scripting and control, and I want you to read that. And I want you to read that specifically because I want you to read it and look at how that theory of scripting and control is taking place as you are engaging with co-creating, doing the learning, self-producing the learning experience here through co-creation, how is scripting and controlling taking effect here? So it's a meta element for you to look at. All right, continuing down to the consumer needs and values. Again, we're talking CB theory. So one of the things that we want to talk about is during the service encounter, there are four critical, absolutely mission critical, consumer needs to have under control in the service encounter. Security, and that is the sense of safety inside the service. Particularly if you are engaging in a service that has a level of risk to it, you can reduce the risk by perceived safety. Actual safety is also helpful, but perceived safety matters. It's entirely possible to have a very safe, very secure, very security conscious, physically safe, economically safe service that is psychologically terrifying because there are so many psychological cues about the level of danger involved. So it's got to be perceived safe as well as safe. Respect. An important facet here is that sense what of being valued as a person. Inside a service, it can occasionally be, you know that you are money for services. You know it's a transaction. You know it's a financial relationship, but you don't want to feel like you're just being processed. You want to feel like you're actually still a person. 
which is why it's vital to never refer to your customers as revenue units to their face. Always important. Esteem is also about the fact that during the service experience, unless you're paying for your ego to be broken, beaten down, and generally uh, reassessed, you want to be treated well as a person, and you want to come out of it with your pride intact. Unless, of course, you are doing some form of physical fitness training program, in which case you, you park your pride at the door, because that's one of the things you're going there for. Fairness and equity. You also want to feel that during the service, that someone of a similar, a customer of a similar nature to you is getting a similar treatment. You don't want to feel that somebody's getting bet a better deal. Now, if there are tiers and structures, so there's a gold class, a silver class, a bronze class, and an aluminium class, you want to make it clear distinctions and differentiations so that the people in aluminium know that the people who are getting the special treatment aren't in the same category, so there's no equity or fairness issue. It's like, yeah, I'm in aluminium, I'm in the cheap seats, I'm in the cheap seats. Therefore, I expect less than the expensive seats. Simultaneously, if you're in the cheap seats, and it's quite obvious you're getting a better deal than the people in the gold tier, that's breaching fairness and equity. So, just treatment is literally that. It has to be just to the level of customer that you are. All right, another theoretical framework that becomes important over the length of the semester, the critical incident. These are the points where the customer interacts with the service staff. And we've got three of the important ones here on screen. Critical incidents will recur when we start talking about uh, the role of the customer and the role of the employee, but they're also about understanding that additional element of the marketing mix about people. They show up again in service design and service blueprinting. So it's a big, again, a good theory, uh, an important theory, and one that I want you to get to familiarize. It's a theory that works well in a lot of assessment. It's a theory that sits alongside a lot of assessment frameworks quite well. So a critical incident is where there is a significant customer satisfaction or customer dissatisfaction event. Now, a significant customer satisfaction event, a critical success, is as important to map, understand, analyze, and possibly shut down as is customer dissatisfaction. Critical satisfaction that occurs from chance, modifies people's perception of the service, alters the service encounter. So a critical incident is what's going to, you want the critical incident to sit inside the zone of tolerance or towards desired. If it's inadequate, you're going to trigger service recovery, which is towards the end of the book. If it's a positive critical incident that goes above the desired service, you need to be tracking and mapping those so that you're not accidentally raising the zone of tolerance without control over what's happening in your service. All right, final, final block. Inside this chapter, there is a case study, the mini case study, where we're talking about the personal trainers. Now, what I want you to do for yourself, so I want you to look at this mini case and I want you to address these four questions. Now, we're not going to talk about this case in the tutorials. We're not going to talk about this case anywhere else. This is about you co-creating value. So the case questions, three of them, are in the book. The fourth one I want to raise your attention to. How will the clients co-create the value they're going to get from personal training. And this is what I want you to think about here in this case is looking at the theory, looking at the frameworks, looking at the elements you've seen thus far that in the chapters, how does co-creation kick into gear for personal training? Now, if you're not familiar with co-creation and you're not conversant with it, 
that's where you've got to go off and do your own research. Boot up Google Scholar, boot up Google, throw in the words co-creation and co-create and learn a bit. All right, that's the chapter. So here's your checklist, the video, read the book chapter. Remember, as you're reading, take notes, be engaged, not just highlight passage of text in the book or on the Kindle, take notes. Get the pen out, get the paper out, get the keyboard out, do, what, do whatever's your strength to take your notes. Prep your two questions, get your readings together. Remember, your lit review is an ongoing process, so each chapter comes with a reading. But also, what should, how do I think about this? This is a question for you. What are the risks associated with the tutorial discussion? How do you personally mitigate and reduce those risks so you feel free to talk in a tutorial? As always, if you need me, there's my contact points, and that's a wrap for this chapter.